Welcome back to Philosophy 103, Introduction to Logic. This is Unit 6, Inductive Reasoning and Informal Fallacies. In this brief lecture, we'll focus on fallacies of relevance. In our last video, we gave a general overview of the concept of fallacy. At its heart, a fallacy occurs whenever something goes wrong in an argument, which prevents the conclusion from following the premises logically. In the case of a deductive argument, fallacies occur whenever the form or structure of the argument is incorrect. That's why we call them formal fallacies, because they're literally an improperly formed argument. But inductive reasoning doesn't have the strict set of rules that we find in formal deductive systems like term logic or predicate logic. Informal reasoning, or induction, works by gathering sufficient amounts of relevant evidence, which, when clearly presented, leads us to believe the conclusion is more likely than not. So informal fallacies, unlike their formal cousins, are not strictly defined. There's no simple set of rules that help us to identify when an informal fallacy occurs. This is the main reason evaluating inductive arguments is so much harder than evaluating deductive arguments. There's just far more wiggle room in induction, and deciding whether or not there's a sufficient amount of relevant evidence for a conclusion is really more of an art than a science. We did, however, discover that there are four general types of errors that tend to infect induction. One of the first questions that we have to ask when deciding if an inductive argument is strong is whether or not the premises are relevant to the conclusion. Simply asserting a body of facts will not necessarily make a conclusion follow. The evidence must be relevant to the conclusion. Similarly, there needs to be sufficient amounts of evidence provided in the argument to make the conclusion more likely than not. Drawing conclusions from insufficient evidence is one of the most common mistakes when applying the inductive method. There's also a group of fallacies associated with unstated assumptions or hidden premises in inductive reasoning. And finally, there's a family of fallacies which are the direct result of a lack of clarity in the premises or conclusion of an inductive argument. Approaching informal fallacies by learning about these four groups or tribes or species of errors is without doubt the best way to begin learning about inductive fallacies, since there's probably an infinite number of actual errors that could occur in inductive reasoning. In this video, we are going to focus on the first of these species, fallacies of relevance. Since inductive reasoning can never give us certainty, we want to make sure that the conclusions we reach are as reliable as possible. In our last video, we introduced the metaphor of the bridge to understand the nature of induction. Because there's no necessary connection between the premises and conclusion, we want to be able to bridge the logical gap that always exists within the argument. What that bridge is made out of is directly relevant to our success in reaching the other side. Remember, we want strong inductions, not weak ones. So the premises we use must be relevant to the conclusion we're trying to secure. But all too often, our inductions become infected with premises that are irrelevant to the conclusion we're trying to reach. One such example is when we attempt to persuade by taking a shortcut around reason. Humans are profoundly emotional beings, and manipulating emotions is a very effective way of getting people to believe or act in a certain way. By manipulating people's emotions, we can cause changes in them. But this is not an exercise in reason. Remember, the goal of giving an argument is to persuade by reason alone. Love and fear are two of our most basic emotional states, so that's a pretty good place for us to begin thinking about fallacies of relevance. No one desires to be harmed. But if the only reason one has for drawing a conclusion rests on fear, it's a pretty good bet we have fallacious reasoning. We call this appeal to force, or ad baculum. Now oh, what? <gasps> Sorry we're late. Could we have the money now? The answer is no. I'm afraid I must insist. 
You see, my wife, she has been most vocal on the subject of the pretzel monies. Where's the money? When are you going to get the money? Why aren't you getting the money now? And so on. So please, the money. You heard her. She said no. Legs, Louis, advance on them. Now in this clip, Fat Tony doesn't remind Marge that they entered into a business contract and that therefore she has a moral obligation to keep her end of the bargain. And even if, as in the case of Marge's pretzel business, Fat Tony had lured her into an unfair agreement, she still freely entered into it. But Tony doesn't remind Marge of any of this, nor indeed of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware which might have convinced her of her obligations to pay up while also exposing her naivete. Instead, he tries to take a shortcut around reason. He tries to manipulate Marge's fear by explicitly threatening bodily harm. While from a psychological perspective, this might be an efficient method to get someone to act in a certain way, it is not rational. It is fallacious. But fear isn't the only emotion that distracts us from the demands of reason. Even our concern for others can be used to distract us from what reason requires when trying to construct an argument. Just because we feel bad for someone or something doesn't mean that reason should take a back seat. I'm learning! Aw, oh, way to go, Ralph. Ah, she's a beaut. You can't beat a Coleco. How many can I put you down for? A lot? Please say a lot. I need this. I don't know. I'm not even sure we can keep this one. It's up to Lisa. What do you say, Lisa? Will you keep our little secret for the good of your classmates and your school? And let's not forget old Gil, huh? <laughs> the wolf's at old Gil's door. Oh, I guess I don't have much choice. Notice that in this clip, Lisa doesn't feel like she has a choice. She feels compelled to make a decision, not based on rational evidence, but rather because her feelings of pity for Ralph, her unfunded school, and even Gil, the worst salesman in the universe, are being manipulated by Principal Skinner and Superintendent Chalmers. Of course, Lisa will eventually make the right decision and admit that her cheating made the school grant possible, but in this moment, she's being persuaded by poor inductive reasoning, a blatant appeal to pity. Another common form of irrelevant support for a conclusion is based on our emotional response to groups which, with which we identify. To assert that some conclusion follows because other people believe it to be so, or even the opposite, think about conspiracy theories where the emotional satisfaction that people receive is in knowing something that other people don't know. These problems exemplify how what others believe can be a powerful force in persuasion. But they shouldn't be. These are fallacious reasonings. What's often called the bandwagon fallacy appeals to our desire to be one of the crowd, or our acceptance of what is already accepted. But this fallacious form of reasoning equally cuts in the opposite direction, since our desire to be special, or in some cases even superior to the group, is no more evidence for a proposition's truth than its universal acceptance would be. It is essential to always keep in mind that what is true is not evidenced by the fact that someone believes that it's true. Whether the belief is popular or unpopular is utterly irrelevant to whether or not it matches how the world actually is. So there I am, being nice to Alex, and she takes all of my friends and ditches me. I'm sure they didn't ditch you, honey. Maybe they won't have to plan a surprise party for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Good one, Mom. They only like her because she acts too grown up with her perfume and her cell phone and... Oh, and get this, Mom. She drinks iced tea. Lisa, I can't imagine anyone being more likable than you. But apparently this new girl is. So my advice would be to start copying her in every way. But, Dad... Uh-uh, think. Is that what Alex would say? So manipulating our desires to be part of a group, 
as well as appealing to our sense of uniqueness, are both forms of irrelevant data and should not be accepted as evidence for verifying a proposition's claim to be true. Yet another common form of using irrelevant premises in order to draw a conclusion occurs when we focus on the person rather than on the argument itself. When considering whether the conclusion of an inductive argument follows strongly from the premises, we should not be distracted by anything not directly relevant to the truth of the conclusion. People of poor character can be right about the facts, just as people of good character are often wrong. Thus, to attempt to draw a conclusion based upon the nature of someone's character is just as fallacious as manipulating someone's fears, or their pity, or their desire to be accepted. The most obvious form of ad hominem is directly attacking a person's character. But remember, the truth is determined by how the world actually is, not an individual's moral disposition. A more subtle form is the circumstantial ad hominem, where association is asserted to be evidence. This is a perversion of the inductive correlation, which can, with sufficient evidence, give us a justified belief. But merely pointing to someone's association, usually negative ones, is really nothing more than a disguised personal attack. And then, of course, there's the two coquet fallacy, where one tries to change the focus of attention by pointing out that we're guilty of the same thing. Focusing on the person rather than the argument may be common, but it isn't rational. I'm sorry my opponent didn't think enough of you to show up for this debate. I'm sure he had more important things to do. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry I'm late, everyone. Somebody tampered with my brakes. <gasps> well, then you should have been early. <laughs> got you there, eh? Oh, come on, people. This man has promised round-the-clock trash pickup. That's impossible. Not if we hire more men. And my men will do all your messy jobs. They'll wash your car, scrub your shower, air out your stinkables. <laughs> I can't believe what I'm hearing. Well, then you better turn up your hearing aid, Pops. Pops? I'm only two years older than you. Do we want old man Patterson here with his finger on the button? What button? What the hell are you talking about? What, 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 what button? Where am I? Who took my false teeth? <laughs> Notice that Homer here isn't giving the citizens of Springfield reasons that his policies are better than those of his opponent. He's just attacking him, both directly by calling him old and indirectly by suggesting his tardiness to the debate is caused by being drunk. This is a classic case of ad hominem, or attacking the person, rather than the issue. The straw man is the final fallacy of relevance we want to introduce today. It's easy enough to hit a stationary target. It's something altogether different to hit one that's in motion. That's the origin of this fallacy's name. It comes from a time when archers used stationary targets to hone their skills. But to put an arrow on the target when it can't move is certainly much easier than trying to hit one that's moving. In the same way, to oversimplify an argument in order to knock it down is a logical cheat. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. You can't really miss. Hello, everybody. I'm Troy McClure, star of such films as P is for Psycho and The President's Neck is Missing. But now I'm here to tell you about a remarkable new invention. Until now, this was the only way to get juice from an orange. You mean there's a better way? But that's all changed, thanks to the juice loosener. Let's meet the inventor, Dr. Nick Riviera. Hello, Troy. Hi, everybody. Hi, Dr. Nick. Troy, would you like a glass of orange juice? I sure would. But won't we have to pay those outrageous grocery store prices for something the farmer probably spit in? Not anymore. All thanks to the new juice loosener. Doctor, are you sure it's on? I can't hear a thing. It's Whisper Quiet! 
got all that from one bag of oranges? That's right. Order now, and you'll also get Sun and Run, the suntime lotion that's also a laxative. Infomercials are notorious for oversimplifying problems in order to offer a solution you don't really need. The straw man fallacy is basically the same thing in induction. Oversimplifying an issue makes it easier to offer solutions that don't really address the issues at all. Or getting around an argument by deliberately ignoring the complexity of the reasoning or evidence required to reach the conclusion allows you to avoid, albeit illegitimately, the difficulty of the topic. Straw man is a favorite among politicians and policymakers who want to offer simple solutions to complex social problems, as well as religious figures who believe the complexities of human behavior and dysfunction can be solved by applying vague universal formulae. It's important to remember that the fallacies of relevance that we've explored in this short video represent only the tip of the iceberg. As we've said before, there are an infinite number of ways inductive arguments can fail. These are just a handful of the most common examples of fallacies of relevance. And you're going to find, as you explore inductive reasoning, that these fallacies are not always clear-cut. The basic question to keep in mind is, is the evidence I'm being given relevant to the conclusion that we're trying to reach. If so, you can move on to ask whether or not we have enough evidence, or whether we've made any unwarranted assumptions in the context of the argument, and is the evidence free from ambiguity that would cause the conclusion to go astray? We'll move on to these topics in the following videos as we learn a little bit more logic. See you next time.